And about 60 years later, the stone was put back into the Kaaba when it was rebuilt. Now, the only problem is the volume of that stone had shrunk by 60% between when the Ismailis put it out and when it was officially put back. And in the later rebuildings of the Kaaba, you can clearly see that earlier it used to be huge, and now it's really small. So what happened to the missing 60% of this extremely rich in platinum, palladium, iridium, rhodium meteorite? What happened to it? Well, apparently, the, Chi the Caliph of Cairo, the Fatimid Caliph, kept most of it, and he passed it on to his son and his grandson. And his grandson, El Harun the Mad, the Mad Caliph, about a hundred years before the Crusades, uh, apparently got a little bit too fond of it and didn't understand how to work it, and it drove him crazy. And the tradition is he buried his most secret treasures under the temple, Herod, the remains of Herod's temple in Jerusalem, and walked east into the desert and disappeared. Now, one of the things El Harun the Mad did was he declared the entire city of Jerusalem was off limits to Christians. Then a few years after his time, the Turks swept out of Central Asia, conquered the whole region, drove the Fatimids back, and they also continued the idea that Christians could visit the city, but they couldn't visit the holy places. And slowly over time, this became the cause of the Crusades. So the first crusade, wading through blood up to the horse's fetlocks, conquered Jerusalem. And the first thing the new king of Jerusalem did was install a group of very strange knights in the ruins of Herod's temple, supposedly to protect travelers, although there were only a dozen of them, so how could they possibly protect travelers? And what they really seem to have been doing was carrying on archaeological excavations under the temple. Twenty years down the line, they made a discovery. And they took that discovery back to Europe, and they collected the greatest Kabbalistic scholars of that age to analyze the find. And within 30 years, we're off and running again with authentic, validated, seen in front of everybody, transmutations. So, the source of these new transmutations would seem to be the information and the material found under the temple. And as we begin to track this, we begin to see that they had the prima materia, and there may even be a little bit of it left, buried under Notre Dame Cathedral. That's another story. But they didn't know how to make it. They didn't know how to get any more. They knew how to use the meteoric glass they had to produce the powder of projection and the, the Philosopher's Stone and therefore turn lower metals into gold, but they didn't know how to make it. They didn't know how to make the powder of projection. So over time, it was lost. Now the Templars were really screwed up around the year 1300. They performed a transmutation in front of the King of France and the Pope. And they gave the crucible to the Pope's assayer, his treasurer. And the Pope's treasurer validated it as this is 100% genuine. This gold is purer than anything we could make. This is purer gold than anything we've ever seen. Now that sort of preyed on the mind of the King of France as he sunk deeper and deeper into poverty and owed more and more money to the Templars. How come these guys that are working for their own agenda have all this power, all this gold, and I don't. How come I have to borrow it from them? Mm. So eventually, the Pope and the King of France came up with the idea that we'll just declare the Templars illegal and we'll take the secret from them. Well, like Fast Eddie Kelly, uh, the Templars said, uh-uh. And the Pope and the King of France didn't get the secret. And due to the Black Death and other things, the secret was lost until 1388 when a marvelous fellow named Nicholas Flamabel discovered part of the documents, a copy of what they found under the temple. Fla Flamel, yes. Discovered uh, a copy of the documents that showed how to do it. And he also discovered a piece of the stone. 
And so we have another wave of documented, authenticated transmutations starting in 1388. And as that little piece of stone began to run out, the transmutations dropped off. So that by the time of D. and Kelly, there were very few documented transmutations. Now, Kelly thought he had some of the powder of projection when he arrived in Prague, and he very quickly discovered he didn't. Now, one of the great regrets that I have of this whole thing is that Dee's magical diary for the year 1585, in which all of the alchemical research was conducted, is missing. Whether Dee didn't keep it, he kept it in another place, and it's therefore lost, or whether some lucky person may turn it up among the debris in the British Library, we don't know. It may still be there, may not. But during 1585, Kelly and Dee discovered that what they had thought was the powder of projection was worthless. But they stumbled onto the fact that Prague itself was a large macrocosmic version of an alchemist crucible, and that the, as Michael Meyer showed in one of his drawings, that the prima materia in Prague is in the water, in the trees, in the air, in the river, in the road, it's everywhere. This is what all that's left of the megalithic Prague Stonehenge that Labusa was standing at when she declared when she declared that she saw the golden city of Prague. Now, curiously enough, about 120 million years ago, a silica meteorite, roughly 70 kilometers across, smacked into Prague, smacked into central Bohemia. And it created a cup within a cup. It created the seven hills of Prague, which are the inner crucible, and then it created the mountains that surround the edge of Bohemia, that's the outer edge of the crucible. And it vaporized with such a tremendous explosion that all this meteoric dust became infused into everything. And at the center of the crater, where the meteorite hit, it melted the rock, it melted the granite, and condensed it. These, the granite in these megaliths here are of such a fine quality that I have seen nothing like it except on the inside of the king's chamber. Okay? And in these rocks, as you can see, there's a gold streak. Golden this is quartz. This is quartzite. But it's quartzite that is, this is not the sun. The sun is shining in a different direction. This is literally golden quartz. So somewhere along the line in 1585, Dee and Kelly discovered that the prima materia was literally everywhere in Prague. And Perhaps they even went and chipped a, a piece off of these stones to restart their powder of projection. Now, curiously enough, for 200 years before this time, there was this legend in Prague of the Jewish Kabbalist creating a protector for the Jewish people called the golem. And the golem was made from river mud and river sand, which is full of this meteoric glass. And through a process very similar to the energetic magical process that you do for the transmutation, the river mud sand monster was brought to life. And at the time that Dee and Kelly were in Prague, the last of the great golems was created by Rabbi Lowe. Now, Rabbi Lowe was a very famous Kabbalist, and he was also a good friend of Dee and Kelly's. And he was also one of the few Jews ever to be honored by a head of a European state. He was also a good buddy of Rudolf II. So the magical spiritual technology was in place from making the golems. You simply had to apply that to the right prima materia, and you produced a powder of projection. And then from there, it was a very simple matter. You could run down to the basement and whip it up to show visitors to turn lead into gold. And again, 
Kelly and Rabbi Lowe 